This month is Missouri Missions Offering Month, and that's why the, the video we showed shows the ministry that takes place on the campuses of our uh, colleges and universities throughout the state. And I didn't, ca- I didn't quite catch which, which college was he at. SEMO. So Southeast Missouri State University in Cape Girardeau, which is just about as far southeast in the state as you as we are northwest in the state, it's a long way down there. But the thing that, that uh, uni- one of the things that unifies us is this same ministry, this same commission that we have. Our, our congregation helps to support the work of the, uh, of the local, what is now called Christian Challenge. It is still Baptist uh, Collegiate Ministries, but just a different, a different name. Uh, and BSU, uh, is what most of us probably know it know it as, but Paul Damry, Paul and Jayla Damry have been laboring for many years now on the on that campus and have have included others on that leadership team even even recently. And uh, in fact, I think Will Will Anderson is a part of that uh, leadership team as well on campus. I just saw him the other day uh, meeting with a student in the student union, and. Uh, uh, we we have the opportunity to uh, to assist that ministry normally by providing a meal sometime usually sometime in the fall for one of their uh, one of their gatherings and it'll be in October this year for us and you'll see more information about that forthcoming. There are envelopes in the pew if you want to give through the uh, Missouri Missions offering. Please feel welcome to do that. Take your bulletin in hand if you would, and inside you'll find lots of. Great information regarding the service and announcements and so forth. And there's a, there's a perforated tab there that I would ask that we just all tear off together. And we want to say welcome especially to our, to our guests today. If you're here for the first time or the first time in a long time, we would love to have a record of your visit on the side that says welcome. Just fill that out as much as you feel comfortable. On the other side, there's a place to record any decisions or requests for information anything you'd like to communicate to us. And in the back is a chest that is, uh, that is there for the purpose. If you came prepared to give uh, an offering, that's where you can do that. And you can also place these, uh, these completed cards there if you, would, if you would so choose or you can hand it to me after the service. We want to say welcome to those that are joining us by way of Facebook Live as well. Thank you for being here. I know that we even have... Uh, uh, some members who, if they can't make it on a given Sunday, they tune in to to that to that uh, Facebook Live, and it's a it's a it's a great way to stay connected if you aren't able to be with us in person. But we do, of course, invite all those who are able to in the future to join us in person as we worship the Lord together. All right, let's begin our worship service, but. Uh, with the reading of Scripture, Psalm 98, 1 through 9, that is our call to worship. I think the words appear on the screen. And verses 1 through 9, which is the entire, uh, entire psalm. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for He has done marvelous things. His right hand and His holy arm have worked salvation for Him. The Lord has made known His salvation. He has revealed His righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered His steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre. With the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. I didn't count up the times it said we're instructed in this psalm to sing to the Lord, but there's enough there that we know that's what we're supposed to do, right? As we worship the Lord, let's worship Him with singing and making a joyful noise to Him, not only with our mouths, but from our very hearts. Amen. 
Let's stand together as Pastor Kyle comes to lead us in song. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, Deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light, it streams from the hills, it descends to the plain. And sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our Maker, Defender. Joyful noise unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Last week, uh, we read about Moses, who was to make two new tablets. And if anybody doesn't remember why we had to have two new tablets, it's because he broke the first two. And if you don't remember why he broke them, he got angry, because when he came down from the hill, he saw that they were worshiping the golden calves, and it frustrated him. You can try to visualize what Moses looked like, but he dropped the tablets and broke them. So then Moses met with God, and he wanted to see God, but at that time God wouldn't reveal himself. He said that if he was to look at God, he would probably die, or he would die. No one could see God. But God wanted to make a new covenant with him, and last week David read the first part of that covenant, new covenant, and today in verses uh, 18 through 35 on chapter 34, I'll read the rest of the new covenant. And God said, You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you, at the time appointed in the month of Abed, for in the month Abed you came out from Egypt. All that opened the womb are mine, he said, all your male livestock, the firstborn of cattle and sheep, the firstborn of a donkey, you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. You shall observe the feast of weeks, the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the feast of ingatherings at the year's end. Three times in a year shall all your males appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. For I will cast out nations before you and enlarge your borders. No one shall covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened, or let the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover remain until the morning. The best of the first, first fruits of your ground you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And the Lord said to Moses, Write these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He neither ate bread nor drank, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant the new Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin on his face shone because he had been talking with God. 
Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining, and Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. Amen to the word of God. You may be seated as we prepare for a time of prayer. You may choose to remain seated. You might choose to kneel. You might uh, choose to stand as we pray here in a moment. But whatever your posture, my prayer is that it would reflect your uh, heart before the Lord this morning and that we would uh, be able to do as a congregation to, to come to the Lord to receive mercy in our time of need, to lift up the the needs of this congregation and those who are ill and infirm, and as well as uh, as well as acknowledge our need for God's mercy day in and day out. How many needed the Lord's mercy this week? How many needed the Lord's mercy this morning? How about right now? Yes, all of us. We're all in that category. And because we live by the mercy and the grace of of God poured out to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is is in light of the gospel, of of the good news of Christ. It is the grace by which he has saved us. It is by that same grace that we live. So let's bow before the Lord this morning as we go to him in prayer. Our Father and our God, we have come to this place as your people, acknowledging you to be the Lord of all, and yet also acknowledging that we have fallen short of your glory. We have sinned and we have wandered away from the path. At times, Lord, we have shunned the very mercies by which we live. And yet you have still loved us. You have still provided for us. It is your loving hand of providence that has guided us. And even though we make plans, it is you who directs our way. May we never forget that, Lord. May we not only rest and acknowledge your sovereignty in and acknowledge your sovereignty but may we rejoice in it may we relish the the thought of of your control over our lives and that you have given us salvation in Christ and it's through him through his finished work on the cross that we approach boldly the throne of grace to receive mercy in our time of need, as the writer of Hebrews says. Lord, we thank you for the glorious salvation you've given to us, for making us right before you because of the precious blood of the Lamb which was shed for our sins and our salvation. We can now draw near to you and approach you Lord, how different it was for the people of ancient Israel who could not even come close to you but had to go through a inter, the intermediary, intermediary of, a, of a human priest who would offer up the sacrifices on their behalf. Perhaps they would have to stand at a distance. And yet now, Lord, because of what Christ has done, you 
beckon us, you welcome us, you give us access to you, which is no longer veiled, but we go through the veil of Jesus' flesh, through his finished work on the cross, the cross on which he cried out, it is finished. The penalty has been paid in full. The penalty for our sins, the sin of all those who come to you in faith, repenting and believing on the name of the Lord Jesus. How we rejoice in that. Or may we take just a few moments to, to acknowledge and to uh, confess and repent of perhaps that sin that has so easily beset us this week or perhaps this very hour. Father, we could literally spend hours in this, in the, in this moment of prayer. But Lord, we, we take the moments that we have, we give them to you. And thank you for the wonderful pardon that we receive from you because of Christ. Lord, we pray for those among our number who are not able to be with us today by, because of travel or other obligations, perhaps because of necessity of work, illness or infirmity. We pray for those who are hospitalized, those who are uh, resident in the nursing home, those who are homebound. And Father, we pray that your grace would be simply multiplied to them as we offer our prayer for them. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for our world. Father, we pray that as a nation we would turn back to you. That we would acknowledge not only your sovereignty, but your, your absolute lordship over every aspect of our lives. And may Jesus receive all of the praise, all of the glory. And may he be preeminent. These things we pray in the precious name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Hear these words of assurance from Psalm, or from, rather from Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Words that remind us of the full pardon that we have received in Christ. Isaiah writes in the inspiration of the Spirit, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon those of us who have received that pardon from Christ know this by personal experience. We have that abundant pardon, that free and full forgiveness. Those who have yet to experience that, we, we pray that the Lord will draw you to himself today by his word. That little word return is the most frequently used word in the Old Testament to describe repentance. Return to me. Wonderful words of assurance. Amen. We respond to that word in song today. Amen. Would you stand together as we're reminded that God allows anyone to approach you? Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed. Verse 
says, just as I am poor, rich, and blind. Go to that verse. Just as I am poor, rich, and blind, sight, rich, is healing of the mind. Gay all I need in thee to find, O Lamb of God, I come. I share our uh, catechism for this week, and it's going to be up on the screen here, if we can go ahead and put that up. The question today is, what benefits do believers receive from Christ at death? And the answer from God's scripture is, at, at death, death, the souls, souls of believers are made perfect in holiness and immediately pass into glory. Their, their bodies rest in their graves till the, the resurrection. resurrection. And the next question we have is 42. What benefits do believers receive from Christ at the resurrection? And the answer is, at, at the resurrection, resurrection, believers are raised up in glory. They shall be openly acknowledged and acquitted in the day of judgment, and made perfectly blessed in the full enjoyment of God to all eternity. Those two questions, if they were more uh, commonly taught and known and understood in our uh, community and in our society, uh, boy, that would that would save a lot of heartache for people. Yeah. All right, let's continue to sing. Oh, to see 
the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then. song to go on, didn't you? What a wonderful truth. You may be seated. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, praise team, for leading us in our congregational praise this morning and for truly preparing the way this morning as we focus our attention on the Word of God. If you have your copy of the Scriptures, we're going to be in Acts chapter 1 momentarily. I simply want to echo what uh, Pastor Kyle mentioned just a moment ago relating to our catechism questions. Those uh, questions, by the way, come from the uh, so-called Baptist catechism. It goes back to around 1693, the framers of the Second London Confession uh, saw a need for a way to, to, to teach the faith to the children. These are, these are catechism questions intended for children to learn the faith. And the fact that we have benefits that we receive from Christ, both in this life and in the next, is such an important, important thing. And I think what Kyle was probably alluding to is what I've experienced time and time again, and that is 
a misunderstanding of what happens at death for the believer or for anyone for that matter. I've heard lots of different opinions and uh, things that have been shared, and I'm sure you have as well. What we need to do is stick close to the Scripture and remind people of what the Scripture says about that, both that intermediate state between now and the resurrection and then the final, the final state uh, of, the, of the believer. Our ladies on Wednesday morning are going to be reading Randy Alcorn's book, Heaven. I believe I have that correct. I, uh, Jan, Jan wrote me a note about that back there. And that will begin October 11th. It's uh, uh, he has a lot of biblical material there to say. If you're interested in that subject, it is uh, it is one that uh, that he does a good job of sharing in. Well, if you have your Bible with you, and I hope that you do. If you don't, uh, there are there are copies of the Scripture available in the pew. But we're going to be reading Acts one. I'm going to begin in verse 12, even though we covered 12, 13, and 14 last week. I want to do it for context today. So if you are able to stand in honor of God's word, I would ask you to do so at this time. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Then they, meaning the disciples, returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem. Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Acheldama. If you have a New American Standard Bible, the H is given at the beginning of that as a rough breathing, Acheldama. It's an Aramaic word. That is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who is also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the word of God for the people of God. Our prayer is that he would inscribe on our hearts these eternal truths. The eternal truths that he has committed to words on paper that we can read today. And that we would be forever changed by them. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. I never, by the way, get tired of... of marveling at the fact that we're sitting here in this place and virtually every one of us, if we don't have our Bible with us, we have access to one that we can open at will and read. And that is unlike most of the generations of Christianity that went before us. It's an incredible thing. 
to think about. So here we have in this passage what occurred after Jesus ascended back to the Father. After he went up and they were standing there gazing up into the air, marveling at what had just happened. And the angels said, why do you stand, men of Galilee? Why do you stand gazing up into the heaven? Because this same Jesus who ascended, before, ascended to heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go. And he had, he had already told them what they were to do. They were to go back to Jerusalem. They were to go back and, and remain in Jerusalem. Remember, he, he gave them this instruction, stop traveling in and out of Jerusalem and instead stay in Jerusalem, tarry in Jerusalem. The 50 days, or rather the 40 days that he had been with them uh, leading up to his ascension after his resurrection, apparently there was some going back and forth between places like Bethany, which is close to where they were at his, at his ascension, and other towns around. But he said, stay in Jerusalem. And so after the cloud took him up from their sight, the disciples went back to Jerusalem. They went back, and, and, and Luke's account of it in, in the end of his gospel said they went back and they were in the temple daily praising the Lord. And so the temple is obviously the center point or the, the focal point of Jerusalem, the holy city. The word here tells us that they went back and uh, they went back to that upper room. Verse 13 says, when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. So this was their, this was their home base. This is where they were spending uh, the time that they weren't in the temple, the time that they were not occupied with other things. They were in this upper room, the upper room where they had celebrated the final Passover with Jesus, the upper room where many of them had first seen Jesus alive after the resurrection. The upper room where they had likely been instructed during these days leading up to the ascension of Jesus. This was a special place. Now they were waiting there in that place for the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, to come. They were preparing to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Just as Jesus had said. He was going to send the promise of the Father. He would send them a comforter. He would send them another like himself who would baptize them and would, would fill them, would empower them. And that would take place shortly. And it would happen in this very upper room. This was a, this was a special place. took on special significance for the disciples. So... As we come to our text this morning, verse 15, we have to think about this, that in between verses 14 and 15, there must have been some passage of time. We're not told how long. It could have been only a day. It could have been a matter of just several hours. It could have been a few days. It was sometime in that 10 days between when they had seen Jesus ascend to heaven and when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. We're not told exactly when? We have to speculate on that. It could have been a few days, but it simply says, in those days. In those days. What days? The days while they were gathered in that place. The days while they were gathered waiting for the Spirit to come and to be empowered by Him. And so in those days, when the disciples and those closest to Jesus have been devoting themselves to earnest prayer in the upper room, that's what this... That's what this place had been. What it had become was a, de a place devoted to prayer, as we saw in verse, uh, verse 14. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, meaning the disciples um, and also Mary, the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. It's probably about some, somewhere around seven women. We don't know how many brothers. If you add it all up, we're talking a possibility of... Uh, around 20 that are, that are named or mentioned. So based on who's named in this text, it appears that that group was around 20. Now, it's, it could have been the entire group of 120 that was there. We simply are not told the names of everyone. And that's not, that's not uncommon in the Scripture for there to be, uh, you know, not everyone is mentioned. But it does seem like the group has grown and I think at least there's, a, there's an inference there that the entire group of 120 is now gathered 
in verse 15, even if they weren't there before. So this is what's going on. Whatever the case, on this day, that full number of 120 was present. Now, why is that number 120 significant? I mean, it, it sounds just like, you know, it's an account of the number of people that were gathered, right? It's a report. It's, throughout, throughout the book of Acts, we have these little uh, progress reports. We have attendance reports, you know? I don't know that they had a little board hanging back in the back of that upper room that said how many were there for Bible study. What, what was our offering today? And we can speculate on those things, but the fact is they knew that there was 120 gathered there. And why is that significant? I think there's a significance here, partly because of the rabbinic tradition. Now hang with me. At this point, it, it, it's easy to go, okay, I'm checking out. We're starting to talk about the rabbinic tradition now, okay. When, tell me when we get back to the Bible, all right, Pastor? Well, this is important because that number 120 was the minimum number of, Hebrew, or of Jewish males required for the establishment of a local Sanhedrin, a council. Would you take, like to take a guess as to what the ratio of council members to members of the community was 10 to 1 how many now how many apostles were there 12 right one member for each 10 or one one apostle for each 10 in the this new community of faith that's interesting isn't it that this tradition intersects with what we see written here in the, in the text. We're used to associating the Sanhedrin with Jerusalem, aren't we? That's the, the group of, I believe there are around 70 or so perhaps in that, in that group. Correct me if I'm wrong in that. The number is not, not uh, what's foremost in my mind. What's foremost in my mind there is that group was bent on Jesus' destruction. And that's the group that we know about. That Sanhedrin from Jerusalem. We're not, we're not used to thinking about other local communities having a council. But we know that this idea of a council of elders, a council of, of leaders, was common throughout Israel. Common throughout the land. So now the, the analogy here is not a perfect one. It's not perfectly parallel to the Jewish pattern since the Christian group here now includes females along with it. Mary... The, the other women are mentioned pr prior to that. We believe there are other women as well. But even that perhaps is a sign of how the new covenant is, is, new covenant is going to develop and that it is better than the, than the old covenant and that it is that all men and women who are, who are saved are a part of that. So how large was the council to be? The council was to be one for every ten men. Which, by the way... Let's see, if, let's see if we remember some, some trivia here. How many men did it take to establish a synagogue in any particular location? Ten. Ten. That was a so-called minion. M-I-N-Y-A-N. Not M-I-N-I-O-N, but M-I-N-Y-A-N. Minion. And it simply is the word for congregation. I think I've told you this before. The rabbis came up with this. This is not... This is, a, this is a tradition of the elders again. These are some of the things that Jesus had to, had to uh, kind of come up against. But they took that number 10 from the smallest number that that word was ever used for in the Old Testament. And it was used for the number of faithless spies that came back and said, we'll never take this land. Only Joshua and Caleb said that, they, said that, that we would. Seems like they would have said that... It, you know, two, two would, be a, would be the ones we're going to use to establish a co congregation based on the faithfulness of Joshua and Caleb. I digress. But this is the, this, this I think is why the number is significant. Because Jesus ha had chosen 12 special disciples as apostles to make the point that this new community that he is establishing, this new community of faith, 
was to be the true remnant of Israel. Jesus himself is the new Israel, the true Israel. And these men are the true remnant of Israel, faithful to God, even though the rest of the nation might be apostate, especially the, 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 the religious leaders as a whole had, had gone completely into apostasy and, and faithlessness. I mean, you think about it. What was going on? The people were faithful in bringing their sacrifices to the temple. They were faithful in, in assembling and, and, and being at the temple. And they were faithful in doing what they thought they were supposed to do. But the leaders, the, t- the temple leaders, the priests and, and so forth, were apostate. They were faithless. They were, they were no longer doing what God had desired for them to do, even if, even if the people were. And so that's the significance of the 12, to, to correspond not only to this idea of the rabbinic tradition, but to what else? The 12 tribes, right? There were 12 tribes of Israel, and Jesus had already said, you'll judge to these men, these, this ragtag bunch of disciples. You're going to judge the, tri- the 12 tribes of Israel, he told them. Don't you know that had to take them by surprise? You mean us, Lord? Yes, you. We know that when we get to the apocalypse, Re- Revelation, what do we see in the new Jerusalem that has come down? We see the, the foundation names of the, the, the tribes and also the, the names of the apostles are written there as well on that city above the foundation stones. This is a superior covenant that we're talking about. It's a superior group of 12, if you will. And that's why it was so significant. And I think that's what leads us into this, into this necessity for Judas to be replaced. This is what had to be taken care of. This one thing had to be taken care of, this replacement of Judas, in order that the full number of apostles, the twelve, might be present when the Spirit came in fullness. Now, if we don't, if we don't know that that's going to be, if we don't understand the importance of that, when we come to chapter 1, verse 15, and, and, we, and we are launched into this, this discussion of who's going to replace Judas, it sort of looks like, a uh, out of place. What, what are we doing? We're just, we're just having a business meeting here to take care of a, of a minor detail or uh, you know, something to, to check off as a box on a, on a list of requirements. Not at all. It is significant. Even if the name of the one who would take the place of Judas is not all that significant or as, as, as one that we know anything about. It was significant to have this take place. So as we start looking at this section beginning in verse 15, we realize that they were preparing for the Spirit to come in fullness, even in this little detail of replacing Judas. What seems to us as a footnote actually had tremendous weight And I think it's important for us to dwell on all that that meant. I love the way this this section, by the way, is is, uh, is structured. If if you think about, I've I've talked to you before about this, uh, uh, what's called a chiasm. It's sort of a uh, cross-shaped literary device in which you have matter at the beginning that sets up what's getting ready to take place, and then it all moves to a center point. And the center point is in verse 20, where he quotes the psalmist. And he talks about Judas, and then in verse 20, he refers to Judas as being the fulfillment of that passage from Psalm 69. And then he pivots to let another take his office where he talks about Judas's replacement and the rest of it is about how they, how they chose Matthias to do this. So he, he moves in 
to the center point and then out from the center point to, to, uh, to make the main point, which is in, is in verse 20. I think you'll, you'll get it as we go a little further in. So how were they preparing for the Spirit to come? How were they preparing for the Spirit to come? Well, last week we saw that they were preparing in many ways. They were preparing in prayer. They were preparing in hope. They were preparing in uh, unity. Now we see that they were preparing by God's Word. Because what does Peter say here? In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. Now that's, Peter's taken the the leadership, he's the de facto leader among the disciples. He's been that for as long as anybody can remember. And now he stands up and says, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago, or beforehand rather, by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Now this is, this is interesting here because he addresses them. He's, he's talking, about, talking to the whole group here, brothers, Adelphoi. And he points immediately to the scripture. And to us, it's almost like he pulls this scripture out of thin air and, and, and says, this is obviously what it means. We look at it and we're, it's not obvious to us. We have to put ourselves back into the shoes of those who were gathered who knew the Psalms forward and backward. They knew that the Psalms pointed, in many places, pointed to the Messiah. And this is just one of those places. And so Peter points out here in verse 16, the scripture had to be fulfilled. It was necessary, in other words. It was necessary that the scripture be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David. That's almost always going to be a reference to the Psalms when you hear that referred to as David. Concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. In this little section of, of Acts, Judas is going to get more ink written about him than almost any other place in the scriptures, including, including the Gospels. But he's, he is the focus He's passed off the scene, by the way. He's not there, obviously. He says, Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Don't you know that Peter, even in saying that, what must Peter have been thinking? Those who arrested Jesus. Peter surely was thinking, I was there. I was following after. In fact, I followed after to the point that they took him to the place to be tried and it was while he was on trial that I denied my Savior three times. This, this has to be in the background of Peter's thought. Even though now he has been fully restored. Jesus restored him to total and complete uh, his, his, his place where he was before all that happened. But he says, he became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. This is important because what we see here is when it says he was, he was allotted his share in this ministry, the little word is kleron. And I don't ordinarily point these things out, but he was allotted his share in this ministry, kleron, is also the word later for the casting of the lot that they're going to do for Matthias. He was chosen by the lot. Now we know Jesus chose the disciples, chose the apostles. He prayed before he did so, but he chose them. But this is the, the ministry that was allotted to him. Share in this ministry. And that little word, clairon, by the way, is the same word we, we use to get our word clergy or cleric. Those who, are, those who are allotted a ministry, as it were. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. And falling headlong, he burst into the middle and his bowels gushed out. So here we see a parenthesis here, talking about 
Luke is now speaking to his readers. The people that are gathered there in the upper room don't need to know this. They already know this. It's the readers that need to know. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, Hakel Demah, that is, field of blood, for it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it. So Peter is putting this forward and saying, the scripture had to be fulfilled concerning Judas's defection. So if you're following along in your, in your notes, the first blank is by God's word. The second one is, Judas's defection. Now, all week long, I had in mind Judas's death. But notice, it was not Judas's death that left the place vacant. What was it? It was his defection away from his Lord. The fact that he went out and, and, and hung, hanged himself was part of it, but that was not the point that's being made here. That was his response later. He already left his Lord. He already turned away. He became an apostate. So that's why it says, May his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it. In fact, if you go back to uh, Psalm 69, 69.5, if you have a reference Bible, you already probably are there with me already. Uh, actually, I've given it to you in, this, in your notes. 69.5, here's what it says in ESV. Let's see, did I get the wrong? 25, 25, thank you. This is a group effort this morning, folks, and I appreciate it. 25. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents. So here we have Peter quoting this. It doesn't sound exactly the same. It's probably... The, the Bible that they would have ordinarily uh, understood or, or used on a routine basis would have been the Septuagint. So we, it's probably a, a reference to that. But nonetheless, may his camp become desolate, let there be no one to dwell in it, is not readily apparent to us that it's a reference to Judas. But it was to, it was to Peter. And apparently it was to all those gathered there. They knew, they, they had a much deeper understanding, I believe, of the scriptures, particularly the Psalms. Very frequently, the Psalms were completely memorized by the people of that day, particularly the young men who had the opportunity to go to the, to the synagogue to do so. So here's the fulfillment of scripture in Judas's defection, and then immediately there is the fulfillment of scripture in Judas's replacement. When it says, let another take his office, that's a reference to Psalm 109, right? Psalm 109, verse 8. If we read that. It says, may his days be few, may another take his office. Now, as I was, as I was studying this this week, I always like to compare English translations. Does anyone have the, the King James version with you this morning, it says, instead of office, it says what? Bishopric. <laughs> no one thinks of Judas as Bishop Judas, do they? And yet here it is. May another take his bishopric. That's actually a literal translation. It's uh, uh, Episcopone, I think, there. It's where we get our word bishop from. Let another take his bishopric. Let another take his ministry of oversight. This is, this is what Judas was. This is what he left. Now, we believe he was a, was a false disciple all along, but this, was what it's, this is what it says. May another take his bishopric, his office, his, his ministry of oversight. And that's exactly what happens when they begin replacing Judas. So what we see them doing here is they're gathering... And they're preparing for the Holy Spirit to come. And they're preparing by turning their attention first to God's Word. Peter takes them there. And I don't even know if he has a scroll there. He just refers to these passages in the Psalms. And so beginning in verse 21, we see that not only were they proceeding by God's Word, but they were proceeding by faith seeking 
understanding. Understanding. That's the the word that I want to focus on here. They were proceeding by faith, seeking understanding. The Holy Spirit had not come yet. They did not have the benefit of, of having the fullness of the Spirit to guide them, to lead them as they would later on. So right now, they are proceeding by faith, and they're seeking understanding of what's going to happen here. And this is why we, how we know this. Verse 21, Some, So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, so going all the way preceding Jesus' ministry, from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, so the, the ascension, just a few days before, one of these men must become with us a witness to the resurrection. That's the, that's the focus of what this man had to be. He had to be a witness. He had to be one who had seen with his own eyes and heard the message, heard the fullness of the teaching, seen Jesus in his resurrected state and, and, and been with him the whole time, the whole ministry. It's interesting, Matthias is an unknown up until this point. And after this point, he's still an unknown. We don't know anything about him. There's traditions and, and from church history that, will, that would tell us. But here's Matthias, the one who had been with him the entire time. And he is the one, along with Joseph, called Barsabbas, son of the Sabbath, by the way. He was also called Justice. And then Matthias. Joseph gets... Pride of place here. He's the first one named. We know more about him than we know about about Matthias. They put forward to, and they prayed and said, You who know, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry. Let's think about what's going on here. Faith seeking understanding. I, I use that term deliberately because very often... In, in our time, people want to reverse those two. Understanding, seeking faith. Now, hang with me. How often have you spoken to someone and began talking with them about Jesus, talking with them about the gospel, talking with them about their need for a Savior, and they want to talk about whether Adam had a belly button or not? I can't get past in my mind whether Adam had a belly button or not. Maybe the most insignificant question ever, but it's those kind of questions that an un, a, a reason unaided by faith will allow you to stumble on. That's a small thing. I'm, and I'm not, I'm not disparaging those who have real questions and thoughts and, and are trying to reason through some of these things and just can't get past it. Don't, don't hear me say that. But if you're allowing reason to keep you from trusting in Christ, first of all, I don't believe that's, that's the case at all. A full a full understanding, I believe, if, if you are given understanding by the Lord. First, if you're given understanding by the Lord, you already have faith. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's part of what we want to be able to say here. Those who are stumbling on this or, who, who, or also who may be saying, this is why I could never trust God, or why I could never trust the Bible, because this, 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 and this, just building a case, that's not even reason, that's just obstinacy at that point. I believe someone coming to the text who is, is trying to understand it, that the Lord will give them that. And that perhaps the gift of faith, which is the opened eyes, the new birth, the work of the Holy Spirit, will open their eyes, their hearts to this truth. And that there would be faith seeking understanding. This is what, the, what, the, what they were doing in this place. They were seeking to know. And so they start out with the qualifications for an apostle. That's the, that's the next element there under faith seeking understanding. The qualifications for an apostle, what are they? 
It's this. That he had to be with them from the beginning, going in and out among us during the entire time of Jesus, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up. And one of these must become with us a witness to his resurrection. So here's how we know that one of the, quali- the, the qualifications for an apostle were what we see here. This is why I get really skittish when people, when you hear people start using the title apostle for themselves or for some, some leader that's present here, here today. I want to say, mm, you know what it says here? You had to be with Jesus during the time of his earthly ministry. Were you there? Now, maybe, they, maybe they're using that term to mean something that's not this, but it usually is an, it's usually an ill-intentioned uh, use. It's intended to, in, in our day and age, it's intended to say, I'm above you. I am, I am not simply a shepherd. I'm not simply a pastor. I'm not simply a teacher of the word. I'm an apostle. My authority should not be questioned by you. That's the subtext. Okay. That's why I get, that's why I think we need to stick with what the scripture says about those qualifications. Then there's the proposal of two choices. Proposal of two choices. Joseph, called Justice, or uh, Marsabbas, and then Matthias. These are the ones that are put forward. It doesn't say, it says they put forward two. Perhaps it was the the other disciples, we, we don't know. It says they put forward to. It seems likely that it was the disciples. And they prayed. I believe that's the entire number gathering to pray there. They prayed and said, You, Lord, this is the faith element. You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. That's... That's very soft language to talk about the perdition to which Judas was intended and to which he went. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This was little stones that were marked with one or the other man, perhaps his initial or his name, and then whatever stone fell out of the little jar that they were rolling around in first, that was, that was how it was chosen. This is the last time we see choice by lot happen. Why do you think that is? The Holy Spirit comes, everything changes. They have this leadership, this direction. I've given you a couple of scriptures there, by the way, on lots. The first chronicle passage is an actual incident of that. And then Proverbs 16.33 is the verse that says, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. This is how they understood this to, to happen. They understood that God was sovereign over the lot. Again, the word that we mentioned earlier for how Judas had been allotted this ministry, now someone else is going to be chosen by lot and allotted this ministry to take the place of Judas. And it was so important because this, this had to happen for there to be the fullness of that 12, that, that council, if you will, and then the Holy Spirit would come and be, would fall upon that assembly. Just a few takeaways that I want to share with you by way of application, and then I close. The choosing of an apostle to replace Judas as one of the 12 was a singular event, never to be repeated. And I say this for two reasons. First of all, no apostolic succession. This is what you see in in places where there is a a, a succession like pope, archbishops, cardinals, bishops, and so forth. There is is this succession seen from Peter or from the apostles, and it's simply not supportable by Scripture. And then it also relates to the fact that People are taking, kind of taking on this term apostle onto themselves, self-appointed. That also is out of order. This is a singular event never to be repeated. The church now relies on the leadership of the Spirit rather than the casting of lots for decisions. We still 
go to the spirit inspired, spirit written, spirit uh, uh, given word of God. And we listen to what God has to say, the Spirit has to say through His Word. And we rely on that leadership of the Spirit guiding us in that way. And then the third one is simply reiteration of what I said earlier. Be wary of anyone claiming the title of apostle today since this office was limited to the twelve. And I know you're going to ask me about, so why did Paul say he was an apostle? Well, that's a different sermon. Got to wait on that. Come back and you'll find out. All right, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time and the word that you've given to us, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would be about his office work of convicting of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and also uh, for, for those who have not yet come to faith in you, that conviction would issue in a turning, in a, in a, in a repentance and faith in Christ, And then also his teaching ministry, guiding us, leading us, teaching us, reminding us, imparting truth to us, and enabling understanding of that truth. May we take that truth and as we understand it, impart it to others and share it with others and be witnesses to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take and use these moments that we have by way of response to do so in a way that honors and glorifies you. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As Kyle comes to lead us in our hymn of response, let's stand together, sing together. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. If you have prayer needs or concerns or a need to to pray with someone, I'll be here to pray with you. If you need uh, counsel, following the service even, I'll be happy to visit with you about spiritual needs and things that uh, that are on your heart and your mind today but as we sing you respond as the lord would have you to respond Uh, so much truth even in that hymn Savior like a shepherd lead us, guide us show us the way and let us walk in that as I said before if you, if you need to remain after and, and visit about something that's on your heart I'll be around for that purpose and don't hesitate to ask let's sit for just a few moments and have the ministry of announcements All right, so great to see everybody today and uh I was explaining to somebody my experience here at First Baptist Church over the last 25 years, and I think uh, on, on our long trip the other day, and I think I ended up landing on uh, most of these people are pretty much family. You know, as you worship together and share your life with each other and share Christ with each other, uh, there's just a bond that happens in Christ, and it feels like family to me. So I know that you guys feel that same way about each other. 
Um, and so as we, as we look through this next week coming up, there's a lot of things um, that are in your back of your bulletin. And um, there's a couple things that aren't there. And I wanted to say that this Thursday night, um, finally finalized when we're going to start our Christmas choir. So if you want to be in Christmas choir, it's community-wide. Um, come Thursday nights at 6.30. Uh, we're going to do the kickoff this week. We're going to try to do a little rehearsal but uh, mostly get some uh, information and plans made. But it's going to be every Thursday night at 6.30, and then the, either the first or second week of December, that's one thing we're going to decide, is uh, will be our program. So come on out. I heard you sing for the last hour. I heard you singing. You all passed the audition. Congratulations. <laughs> come on out. So And bring a friend with you. Um, also, we have uh, church directory pictures are going to be taken. We've been mentioning that for the last couple of weeks. So September 24th, which is next Sunday, uh, right after church, and uh, October 1st, the following Sunday, right after church, we'll be doing that. Um, I think there was a sign-up that went around Sunday school classes today. And it'll, and be, out and it'll be in the foyer for you okay. if you didn't uh, get it. All right. And there will be retakes if you're not available next week or the week after. We'll, Sounds we'll good. Organize and, that and so, um, nothing fancy. We just want to... Uh, see who you are. Have you, ever, have you ever had somebody say, even in our, our not gigantic congregation, had somebody say, uh, oh, you know, Joe Smith. Who? Mm -hmm. You know that guy, he usually wears a blue shirt, you know, trying to replace that person. <laughs> and if you could just get, go to your director and say, oh, yeah, I've talked to him three times, but I just can't remember his name. So, directory. It's, we're not going to be doing, a, like Pastor Greg said, it's not going to be a photo portraits. Portraits. Doing that, but. Um, so that ought to be uh, really a lot of fun and really helpful for us. We're going to make that a part of our new software as well. So, um, Coming up as you look, uh, next week is also the PRC Be Informed session. There's contact information for Jennifer Morris if you want to let her know you're coming to that. So we may be sure to save you a baked potato and the fixings. And uh, information about uh, Pregnancy Resource Clinic and all that they do. So. And Kyle, there, we, there's a mention of that in the announcement. We need four or five volunteers to help, mainly to help Kathy Kegi kind of get the get the food set up. It's buffet style, so there's not a lot of yeah. serving involved, but refilling of drinks and then clean up afterwards. So if you're interested in helping with that. And you'll need to, if you want to participate in the, the meal, you'll need to do an RSVP too. If you want to be a volunteer, also let Jennifer know or let, let us know? Me know. Let, let me let know. Let us know. Okay, let Pastor Greg know, and he'll give you all the info. Anything else that... Uh, we need that? That's all I know about. No, just uh, there. W one question that you, you sort of alluded to there on the directory, and that is uh, this will be the first time that we will have had both online and print directory, and so we'll have uh, uh, forms for you to fill out before you get, their, get your picture taken that gives all the information you want to share. And um, this, the online portion will be, of course, behind a secure, you know, it's a secure area on the website. It's not available to everyone. It's only available to those who, ha who are, who are uh, supposed to have that password protected and so forth. So that's, that's what that's about. And uh, on the off chance that there will be someone who, d who only wants the print and not the, not the online, we'll try to accommodate that as well. But um, this is just a way to help us become more acquainted with one another, names and faces. And so we encourage you to, to be a part of that. If you haven't already signed up, do so. And I know we've got several that have said, hey, I can't be there next Sunday or the next Sunday, uh, but we'll, we'll schedule, be scheduling a retake date for that. Any other announcements before we, before we give the benediction and to dismiss today? All right. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Let's stand together and hear these words from God's Word as we depart. I hope you never get tired of hearing them. They are the words of blessing and benediction that come from Numbers chapter 6, 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. And God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you as you go.